In our video, What is Messianic Judaism?, we spent time exploring definitions that have been given for the labels Messianic Jew and Messianic Judaism. However, we did not discuss definitions for the non-Jewish members of Messianic synagogues, Messianic Gentiles. In this episode, there are a few distinct sections, so check the description for timestamps if you want to jump to a particular part. First, I'll discuss the definition of a Messianic Gentile. Second, I'll distinguish Messianic Gentiles from other groups with which they could easily be confused. And within this section, I'm going to spend a lot of time distinguishing between Messianic Gentiles and Hebrew roots or one law adherents. Third, I'll discuss unhealthy and healthy attitudes and opinions I've heard held by some Messianic Gentiles, which is a discussion that I think ultimately adds to the ideal definition of a Messianic Gentile. So ideally, Messianic Gentiles do not display any of the unhealthy attitudes and opinions that I'll discuss and do possess the healthy characteristics that I'll discuss. And lastly, I'll briefly talk a little bit about how one can thoughtfully consider whether they are in fact genuinely being led by God to join Messianic Judaism as a non-Jew. So again, check out the timestamps in the description if you'd like to skip ahead to any one of these particular sections before going back in and listening to the rest. So I hope this provides a meaningful and thoughtful continuation of an important ongoing discussion uh, that needs to be happening and is happening within Messianic Judaism. So we want you to be part of that. So please feel free to push back, nuance, or add to any of my thoughts in the comments below. Or you can send us an email at twomessianicjews at gmail.com. That's T-W-O, messianicjews at gmail.com. I would certainly love to hear your thoughts. So let's start with defining Messianic Gentile. In their basic statement, Defining Messianic Judaism, the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations offers this description of Messianic Gentiles. They say, Messianic Jewish groups may also include those from non-Jewish backgrounds who have a confirmed call to participate fully in the life and destiny of the Jewish people. Messianic Jewish scholars Dr. David Rudolph and Elliot Clayman add to this by offering a similar definition and then also a general description of a Messianic Gentile in the book Introduction to Messianic Judaism, and this is what they say. Messianic Gentiles are non-Jews who are called by God to participate in the life and destiny of the Jewish people. They have a special love for the Jewish people involve themselves in the Jewish world, learn Hebrew, honor Jewish customs, and serve as members of Messianic synagogues for decades. For this video, I'd like to put the definition in a little bit more concrete terms. So a Messianic Gentile is a non-Jewish member of a Messianic synagogue who affirms the teachings of Messianic Judaism and has committed to worship and live according to the norms of the synagogue they have joined meaning they do things like keep kosher and attend synagogue on Shabbat and during the festivals while decidedly remaining non-Jews. So I didn't mention the confirmed call as discussed in the UMJC statement and the definition offered by Rudolph and Clayman, not because I disagree with it. In fact, I, I agree with it wholeheartedly, but I think they are offering an ideal definition. Ideally, the non-Jewish members have joined because they are personally being led by the Holy Spirit to join. However, practically speaking, a non-Jewish person can join a Messianic synagogue without having been led by the Holy Spirit, but still affirm the teachings of Messianic Judaism and worship according to our norms, and I think this person could still accurately and objectively be described as a Messianic Gentile. So, whereas Rudolph and Clayman offer, I think, an ideal definition, I'm offering a more descriptive type of definition. That said, at the end of the video, I will share a few thoughts on the importance of being led by God and offer some guidance on how you can gain confidence and whether you are, in fact, being led to join a Messianic synagogue, if it is something that you are considering. And so we find the idea of Messianic Gentile is adequately modeled by the sojourner who dwells among you, as mentioned throughout the Torah. These were non-Jews dwelling in the land of Israel and committed to following the norms of Israel. And also Ruth, the Moabitess, who committed her life to the God of Israel and the Jewish people as a non-Jew. 
and also the God-fearers mentioned throughout the book of Acts, who were non-Jewish participants in synagogues during the early centuries CE throughout the Roman Empire, such as Cornelius in Acts 10. And so with that definition and those descriptions in mind, I would like to distinguish what Messianic Gentiles are not. First, they are not converts to Judaism. Messianic Gentiles decidedly remain Gentile while being members of a Messianic synagogue, which is communicated by the name. Similarly, many non-Jews play an active role in conservative, reform, and reconstructionist synagogues. Many synagogues even allow for non-Jewish membership, like Messianic synagogues. Second, they are not simply Christian visitors of a Messianic synagogue. Messianic Gentiles have made the Messianic Synagogue their congregational home for an extended period and have committed to live according to the norms of the community as full members. Christian visitors do not make this commitment. Third, they are not Christian missionaries who dress up and act like Jews to infiltrate Jewish communities. These are over-enthusiastic Christians with a defective moral compass and an improper understanding of 1 Corinthians 9. 19 through 23. Fourth, they are not Seventh day Adventists. Seventh day Adventism is a sect of Christianity, which some Christians even consider a cult, depending on the, the brand of Seventh day Adventism you might be discussing. These are not Messianic Gentiles. Fifth, Messianic Gentiles are not people who are simply curious about the Jewishness of Jesus, the disciples, and the New Testament. This describes a vast number of people from across the religious and non-religious spectrum. Of course, a Messianic Gentile likely is interested in these things, but simply having this curiosity does not make one a Messianic Gentile, nor does it even necessarily mean that one should become a Messianic Gentile. Nor are Messianic Gentiles Christian Zionists. Christian Zionists are Christians who support the state of Israel for various political and, and theological reasons, and remain members of their church. Messianic Gentiles do overwhelmingly tend to support the state of Israel very naturally, but they have joined a Messianic synagogue. Seventh, and lastly, they are not Hebrew roots or one law adherents. These groups believe that Gentile followers of Jesus are obligated to observe the whole Torah to express their faith in God, including Shabbat, the feast, kosher law, and sometimes even circumcision. Messianic Gentiles understand that Jews have a unique responsibility to keep the Torah, which non-Jews do not have. Admittedly, this is where things get kind of complicated, not only because Hebrew roots and one law adherents are also non-Jews who worship in Jewish-looking ways, so they often look like Messianic Gentiles, but also because there are many Hebrew roots and one law adherents who have actually become members of Messianic synagogues or attend regularly. However, adhering to this theology violates the definition of a Messianic Gentile, a non-Jew who adheres to the teachings of Messianic Judaism, because Messianic Judaism teaches that non-Jews do not relate to the Torah in the same way as Jews. Messianic Judaism teaches that the New Testament instructs that Jewish followers of Jesus maintain a responsibility to express their faith in the Lord and their gratitude of his salvation by observing things like circumcision, Shabbat, the feast, and kosher law, and that non-Jewish followers of Jesus do not have this responsibility. We find this teaching in the Jerusalem Council decision of Acts 15, Paul's rule in all the congregations in 1 Corinthians 7, 17-20, and in Paul circumcising the Jewish Timothy in Acts 16:3 but not circumcising the Greek Titus in Galatians 2.3. For more on the scriptural argument describing the Messianic Jewish perspective in contrast to the Hebrew roots and one law perspective, check out my video, Should Christians Celebrate Sukkot? And you'll learn a lot about it there. Messianic Rabbi Russ Resnick, in his essay explaining the definition of Messianic Judaism offered by the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations, the UMJC, he writes... It is not the mission of Messianic Judaism to call Gentiles to Torah and Jewish roots. Indeed, promotion of Jewish roots, depending on what one means by that phrase, could diminish the unique place of Israel in God's plan. Torah remains a living and relevant document for all believers, Jewish and Gentile. 
but many of its specifics are intended for Israel alone. Messianic Jews are to draw upon the rich tradition of Torah, not necessarily because this tradition is mandated for all believers, but because we are Jews. Gentiles may be moved to participate in this tradition out of love for Israel and the God of Israel, but they must be careful to affirm the unique relationship of Israel to Torah. In a position paper condemning Hebrew roots and one law theology, the International Alliance of Messianic Congregations and Synagogues, the IAMCS, which is affiliated with the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America, they say, We in the Messianic Jewish movement also wish to make clear the fact that we are opposed to one law theology. We do not believe that the Gentile church or Gentile Christians universally are called to the same expression as us. In fact, it is the unity of Jew and Gentile in Messiah, in spite of our cultural diversity, which glorifies God in the body of the Lord via the one new man in Ephesians 2.15. In our view, therefore, it is wrong to admonish Gentile believers universally to think they need to observe the Torah. It is clear, furthermore, that the apostles dealt with this precise question of Gentile Torah observance and answered it on point in Acts 15. Dr. David Rudolph points out an important distinction in how Hebrew roots people understand their relationship to Torah practices like Shabbat, the festivals, and kosher, and how Messianic Gentiles understand their relationship to these practices. He writes this, In my conversations with people who are drawn to the Hebrew roots one law movement, I often point out that there is a difference between personal calling and universal ideal. Some Gentile believers are led by the Holy Spirit to come alongside Jewish people and participate in the rhythm of Jewish life. If someone has a personal calling along these lines, they should not assume that everyone else in the world has this calling as well. In fact, the vast majority of Gentile believers and churches do not have this calling, as evidenced by their not having any sense of divine leading to observe the festivals, etc., By distinguishing between personal calling and universal ideal, we are able to affirm the Gentile believers who says, I sense that the Holy Spirit is leading me to celebrate the festivals, while at the same time being clear that the Hebrew roots one law view departs from New Testament teaching when it asserts that Jewish life is God's universal ideal for the nations. Hebrew Roots and One Law adherents think all aspects of the Torah are commanded to all non-Jews, whereas Messianic Gentiles understand they are individually being led to observe many of these things, not out of a sense of covenantal responsibility like the people of Israel. And they understand that just because they are led, it does not mean everyone else should be as well. Before moving on to discuss unhealthy and healthy attitudes held by Messianic Gentiles, I want to address some other positions that are commonly held by Hebrew roots and one law adherents, which tend to drive them out of churches and into Messianic synagogues. These are perspectives you will hear floating around the Messianic Jewish community because they have been brought in by those who learn from Hebrew roots teachers, which I think is not a good thing because one, these positions are incorrect, and two, they negatively impact our relationship with Christians. The next error of Hebrew Roots teaching I'd like to address is that they think the church is rooted or still steeped in paganism. So the idea that the church is pagan is an internet myth based on bad logic and bad history made popular by atheists and Hebrew Roots teachers. Atheists tend to focus on the supposed parallels between the gospel's presentation of Jesus and the stories of pagan deities in an attempt to cast doubt on whether Jesus even existed, which, if you are curious to hear more about this, check out Jonathan's great three-part series responding to this popular claim. I'll put links in the description. Hebrew Roots teachers claim that Christians worshiping on Sunday and celebrating Christmas and Easter has pagan origins or is even just straight-up idolatry. Unsurprisingly, in my experience, many of the non-Jewish members and attendees of Messianic synagogues who hold to Hebrew Roots ideas and one law theology also hold this view about the church. And about this phenomenon, specifically in regard to Christmas, Messianic rabbi and current president of the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America, Dr. Joel Lieberman, said this in a sermon. 
The attack against Christmas does not come from any of the mainstream Messianic Jewish organizations, not the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations in America, the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America, Tikkun America, or the Messianic Jewish Congregations in Israel, Ukraine, Russia, and South America. Where does it come from? It comes from Gentiles who are embracing their interpretation of a return to Jewish roots. About these claims that the church is pagan, Messianic rabbi Dr. Dan Juster writes, The church-bashing Jewish roots teacher commits what philosophers call the genetic fallacy, where the origin of a practice defines and determines its present usage and legitimacy. The meaning of the days of celebration in the church are what the church tells us that the celebration means, nothing more and nothing less. The meaning of Christmas in a church context is according to the meaning given in the church that is well expressed by the carols and hymns for the season. The accusation against Easter is even more far afield. Sunday is as well the celebration of the resurrection, for Yeshua did rise from the dead on the first day of the week. To claim that resting and or worshiping on Sunday is an embrace of paganism and sun worship is really a bizarre claim, but is regularly made by some of these teachers. Even if Christmas and other Christian practices happen to have some sort of pagan connection in their origin, this connection does not forever defile the practices and ceremonies instituted by the church, which are properly directed toward honoring the Lord. The church's worship and celebrations are obviously aimed at worshiping God, not pagan deities. Christmas is meant to celebrate the incarnation of Jesus. So even though Messianic synagogues tend to honor Yeshua's incarnation during Sukkot, we recognize the church's celebration of Christmas is a wonderful tradition. If you are interested in hearing a response to claims that Christmas is pagan, be sure to subscribe to be notified when our discussion with Michael Jones of Inspiring Philosophy releases in December. He has done impressive research demonstrating that Christmas does not even have pagan origins. This faulty notion that the church is connected to paganism is often coupled with another position that those who listen to Hebrew Roots teachers tend to have. Often those who view the church as pagan come across Messianic Judaism and consider it to be the true church or the pure church because we worship in ways that are very different than churches and are more similar to how the Jewish disciples of Jesus worshipped in the first century. From this, they usually then assert that all Jesus followers should be worshipping in this way, which, in practice, results in a type of one-law theology. Dr. David Rudolph, in his paper outlining and arguing against various types of one-law and Hebrew's teachings and tendencies, writes against this idea. He says, Christian churches are not violating God's will or falling short of God's ideal if they do not observe the Jewish festivals, etc. While the Gentile wing of the church should appreciate its Jewish origins, its Jewish scriptures, old and new, its ecclesial identity in relation to the Jewish people, its Jewish Messiah, and learn about all aspects of Jewish life described in the Bible, Christian churches are not deficient if they do not follow distinctly Jewish customs. The IMCS writes, We do not see Messianic Judaism as the final destiny for all believers in Messiah. We are not the model for the whole world to follow. We are simply who we are in the body because of the unique calling. Among the masses of Gentile believers in the world, though many are devoted friends of Israel, most do not belong to a Messianic synagogue, nor do they identify with the calling of Messianic Jews to orient our lives in a Jewish expression of faith in Messiah, nor do we believe that they necessarily should. About the Messianic Jewish community's relationship and view of the church, the UMJC says this in their expanded definition of Messianic Judaism. This faith in Yeshua unites the Messianic Jewish community and the Christian church, which is the assembly of the faithful from the nations who are joined to Israel through the Messiah. Together, the Messianic Jewish community and the Christian church constitute the ecclesia, the one body of Messiah, a community of Jews and Gentiles who, in their ongoing distinction and mutual blessing, anticipate the shalom of the world to come. So in Messianic Judaism, we view that our Messianic Jewish communities and Christian churches are partnered together in Messiah through faith to serve one another in love and bear witness to the power of the gospel to Israel and the whole world. So while there are non-Jewish members of Messianic synagogues who hold to one-law theology and harmful and inaccurate ideas about the church and Messianic Judaism, 
I do not think they can accurately be called Messianic Gentiles because these things are contrary to the teachings of Messianic Judaism. But how can this be? Why and how are there many Hebrew roots and one law adherents that have become members of Messianic synagogues or begin to regularly attend? I think it's because of a multitude of factors. First, Hebrew roots and one law groups have a dominant presence on YouTube. A Root Awakening has 174,000 subscribers. 119 Ministries has 139,000 subscribers. Unlearn the Lies has 178,000 subscribers. Line in the Lamb Ministries has over 50,000 subscribers, and the list goes on. So the Hebrew Roots teachers get their flawed message out there really effectively. Another factor is that these YouTube channels commonly call themselves Messianic or even Messianic Jews. So what I think must be happening is that people who are curious about the Bible and the Jewish context of the New Testament are on the internet and discovering these Hebrew Roots channels. They are then persuaded by these teachings because Hebrew Roots teachers celebrate the Jewishness of the New Testament in ways that many churches fail to. Unfortunately, these people are not realizing the flaws in these Hebrew Roots and One Law teachings because there are almost zero Messianic Jewish YouTube channels to balance it out and make Messianic Judaism's position known. So then they Google Messianic Jewish Synagogue and start visiting an actual Messianic Synagogue, and they bring in these Hebrew Roots ideas that brought them there in the first place. But then how are they able to become members if their theology is contrary to Messianic Judaism? I think this comes down to how individual synagogues protect the boundaries of Messianic Judaism. I think our synagogues very effectively protect things that are salvation issues, like the nature of God, the incarnation of Jesus, the physical death and resurrection of Jesus as atonement for our sins, and salvation being through faith by grace alone. Very rarely do people who do not hold to these key positions fall through the cracks and manage to become members. When they do, or if a member previously in good standing changes their views to a faulty view, they are promptly corrected and later removed from the community if they do not correct themselves. This must not be happening when it comes to our position concerning Gentiles and Torah and our view of Christian churches. Maybe our synagogues tend to just place the salvation issues on their statements of faith that new members must sign and pledge commitment to in order to join. So ultimately, I think much of the blame falls on our shoulders for failing to take the proper measures to make clear what people are signing up for. While I know some specific Messianic Jewish congregations are very diligent and effective in being clear about these issues with potential new members, we have not done a good job in general of communicating what is in our official position papers and publications to potential new members, nor have we effectively formalized a process to detect if potential members hold to one law theology and or unhealthy ecclesiology. Even though these are not salvation issues, I think that including them in the statement of faith would be a very helpful step in the right direction to more clearly communicate to both parties, that is the synagogue and the one law adherent, that each other's values do not match up. And it even provides an opportunity to have a conversation about the error of Hebrew Roots teachings with the person and potentially help them see what we see taught in the scriptures, and then maybe they become a healthy member of our community, or they properly regain the confidence that the church is the best place for them. It's most beneficial for all parties involved. In addition to including these things in the statement of faith for potential new members, our disavowal of one law theology and our positive view of Christian churches should be more clear in what we preach from our bimas and our pulpits. If our sermons more clearly articulate our understandings of these issues, then it becomes more clear to more people earlier on that a Messianic synagogue is not the proper place for one law adherents or those who think the church is pagan or those that think that we are the true church. I think it's kind of like a job interview. When I go in for a job interview and I'm looking for a work environment that is slow paced, predictable, and high collaboration, I'm going to communicate this to the interviewer and I want the interviewer to let me know whether their work environment is fast paced, unpredictable, and low collaboration. This way, we both know each other's values, and if they don't line up, it's in both mine and that company's best interest for me to seek work elsewhere. All this to say, anyone who holds to one law theology or thinks the church is pagan while the Messianic synagogue is the true church, 
I can't consider them to be a Messianic Gentile because those ideas are against the teachings of Messianic Judaism, even if they happen to be non-Jewish members of a Messianic synagogue. However, it is much better that they are doing and learning about Jewish practices from Jews and alongside Jews rather than in a Hebrew root space which is entirely non-Jewish and often does not practice and teach Jewish traditions appropriately. That said, because they do not hold to the teachings of Messianic Judaism, it is best for them to receive the opportunity to reform their understanding to become in line with Messianic Judaism, but if their reading of the scriptures and interpretation of history leads them to remain adherent to the Hebrew roots ideas, then it is healthiest for all parties for them not to be involved in the Messianic synagogues because of their incongruent values. So now that we know what a Messianic Gentile is and what a Messianic Gentile is not, I'd like to discuss some common attitudes I've heard among Messian Gentiles that I think Messian Gentiles ideally do not have, but if they do, are still legitimately Messianic Gentiles. The first attitude that I consider not ideal is if they are insecure about their Gentile identity, specifically if they wish they were Jewish. This is essentially a softer version of the Hebrew roots error of non-Jews who are so insecure about their identity that they get to the point where they're just calling themselves Jewish. I know some Messianic Gentiles that even though they don't claim to be Jewish, they nevertheless struggle with confusion or wishing that they were. So first off, I think this tendency of some Messianic Gentiles to feel insecure about their identity could largely be resolved if we, as a Messianic Jewish community, did a better job in exploring and teaching the theological significance of Gentile identity in general and the Messianic Gentile in our midst specifically. These teachings should then be reinforced by clearly defining roles and expectations within the community for our non-Jewish members. We have done a lot of work exploring the significance of Jewish identity and what that looks like in practice, but we are lacking in this area regarding Messianic Gentiles. This is one of the reasons why Dr. Mark Nanos' understanding of Paul's use of the Shema is so exciting to me from a theological perspective. For Paul, both Jewish and non-Jewish identity is so valuable in the body of Messiah because Jew and non-Jew worshiping the God of Israel together demonstrates that the God of Israel is the God of the whole world via Messiah Yeshua. Check out my video, The Shema's Impact on Replacement Theology and the Gospel, for a deeper look at it. Not only should the significance of Gentile identity be understood, but it should be celebrated both regarding Christians within the body of Messiah and the Messianic Gentile in the Messianic Synagogue. That said, if you are a Gentile currently considering joining a Messianic Synagogue, but already struggle with wishing you were Jewish, I strongly recommend considering not joining, because immersing yourself in a Jewish environment when you are not secure in your Gentile identity might only increase your insecurities. For Messianic Gentiles who don't experience this insecurity until after they become members and establish themselves within the community, then I recommend praying, studying Acts and Romans, and speaking to others in your community about the value of Gentile identity, both in general and in the context of the Messianic Synagogue. I think there are many who can help you resolve this issue, but there needs to be more done in this area, so having these types of conversations will be helpful in exploring more solutions to this problem and making the solutions more well-known. About this, Messianic Rabbi Jeff Adler writes, As servants of the Lord, we also have a role in helping the people who come to us determine their mishalot, their personal calling, including the Gentiles. We need to help discern whether they have a sincere calling to join us as true partners or not. There are some who, having become disenchanted with their own identity, merely wish to dump it for another. Jewishness may look exotic and alluring, but if their involvement is not Holy Spirit directed, they will be a liability to themselves as well as to the ministry. Their motivation is personal pain, not divine direction. There are, however, Gentiles who genuinely find their sincere calling in involvement and identity within the Messianic Jewish community. The second non-ideal attitude is again a softer version of a Hebrew roots position. I've heard a few Messianic Gentiles express a negative attitude toward the church. So they don't go as far as Hebrew roots, which claims the church is pagan and apostate, but maybe they had a negative experience at the church they were attending, and this drove them to a Messianic synagogue. So there certainly are legitimate reasons to be put off by particular churches and particular pastors and leaders, and this should lead many to stop attending those places. 
My only suggestion is to not extrapolate those experiences and apply it to all churches. Yes, some people in the church have perpetuated some heinous acts, which we as Jews are very empathetic toward, but it's also important to recognize that others in the church have perpetuated many great acts of love throughout history. And most importantly, it's not Christians that make the church holy, it is Messiah. This is the same for Messianic Judaism. Unfortunately, humans, Jews and Gentiles, synagogue and church alike, often fail to represent God's holiness. So let's work towards finding forgiveness in our hearts for those who wronged us specifically and not unfairly cast negativity against the whole institution that those individuals may have been a part. We recognize that God has been active in using the church to make the good news of Messiah known to all nations and that the Spirit has been active in the church throughout history. Early in church history, Christian theologians successfully defended the Jewish scriptures against the heresy of Marcionism. The church preserved the canon of scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. They successfully articulated and defended the incarnation of Yeshua and the doctrine of the Trinity, and the list goes on. About this, Rabbi Rich Nickel writes about the proper attitudes Messian Gentiles should have toward the church. He says that they appreciate the church. Their presence in the Messianic Jewish congregation is not primarily a reaction formation to the bad pastor or bad Sunday school teacher of their childhood. Rather, they appreciate the historic community of Yeshua, understand that churches are the God-ordained home for most believers, but have felt the strong undertow of the Ruach drawing them into Jewish space. Healthy non-Jewish believers who attach themselves to our congregations should ideally love and appreciate their Christian upbringing. The last non-ideal attitude I'll discuss is that some Messianic Gentiles have the propensity to try to recruit Christians to leave their church and join a Messianic synagogue. While it's wonderful that our synagogues often produce this level of enthusiasm, I think recruiting Christians to leave their church and join a Messianic synagogue implicitly communicates that all Christians should belong to a Messianic synagogue instead of their church. It again is somewhat of a softer version of the idea that the church is pagan and Messianic Judaism is the true church. Messianic Judaism recognizes the legitimacy and the value of churches, and we think that as a general rule, this is where Christians can most naturally worship the Lord as non-Jews. There is no need to try to persuade Christians to leave their church and join Messianic Judaism. Of course, I could think of exceptions to this rule, like if you have a Christian friend who has stopped attending church entirely and is on the verge of losing their faith but is willing to attend a Messianic synagogue, well then please invite them to attend. Perhaps the synagogue is where they rekindle their faith and find healing. Then they can be in the proper place to decide for themselves whether they are being led to join the Messianic synagogue or if they're ready to go back to the church. But as a general rule, I think it does harm to the relationship between the church and the Messianic synagogue if members of our community try to remove valuable members from their community for the sake of our own. These non-ideal attitudes can be inversely stated as a list of ideal attitudes. It's best if Messianic Gentiles are secure in their Gentile identity, appreciate the church, and do not try to recruit Christians to leave their church for the Messianic synagogue. Now let's discuss guidelines that I think could help Gentiles who are considering joining the Messianic synagogue determine whether they are genuinely being led by the Lord to do so. But first, I think it's important to briefly comment on the purpose of a Messianic synagogue. Dr. David Rudolph and Elliot Clayman write, The primary purpose of Messianic synagogues is to make it possible for Jews who follow the Jewish Messiah to remain Jews and become better Jews in keeping with the eternal purposes of the God of Israel. This results in Messianic Jews being a visible testimony of Yeshua from within the Jewish people. Rabbi David Chernoff adds, It is God's desire for Jewish people not to assimilate but to continue to be Jewish. The primary way a Jewish believer can continue to live a life as a Jew and not assimilate away from his Jewish people is to be a member of a Messianic synagogue. In a Messianic synagogue, a Jewish believer can continue to worship the Lord in a Jewish way, celebrate the Jewish festivals, raise his children as Jews, and be a testimony to his family and people. So ultimately, the purpose of a Messianic synagogue is to provide a Jewish space to preserve the Jewish identity of Jewish followers of Jesus, a space that has not been readily available for approximately 1,800 years. 
Countless Jewish lineages have been lost throughout history due to the church's insensitive, to put it mildly, treatment of Jewish people and even Jewish followers of Jesus. This is why I and other Messianic Jews have a tendency to want to protect boundaries because we are attempting to prevent Jewish lineages from being severed due to assimilation. That is why it is important for non-Jewish members of Messianic synagogues to have the proper understanding and proper heart toward the Jewish people and for those among us to be genuinely led by the Holy Spirit. So with that, let's look at possible indications that you are being led to join a Messianic synagogue as a non-Jew. So the first two are quite practical and objective. The latter two are more subjective and reliant on your ability to hear from the Lord, but hopefully discussing them still helps. So first, in my view, the clearest indication that you are a non-Jew who is called to join a Messianic synagogue is if you are married to a Jewish person. If you are married to a Jewish person, then you will have or already do have Jewish children. According to the Torah and the New Testament, Jewish children are meant to be raised Jewish. Deuteronomy 6, 4-9 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away. When you lie down and when you rise, bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. A Jewish parent is expected to direct a Jewish household and teach Torah to their children and surround their lives with reminders to obey Adonai. This generational emphasis is repeated in the New Testament. In Acts 21, 20 through 24, James and the elders in Jerusalem tell Paul of a false accusation circulating among the diaspora Jews that Paul was teaching Jews should not circumcise their children and to model a life of Torah. It says this, then they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands of believers there are among the Jews, and they are all zealous for the law. They have been told about you that you teach all the Jews living among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, and that you tell them not to circumcise their children or observe the customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Join these men, go through a rite of purification with them, and pay for the shaving of their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself observe and guard the law. Paul confirms he thinks Jewish children should be circumcised in Acts 16.3 when he has Timothy circumcised who is the child of an intermarriage. Also, 1 Corinthians 7.17-19 7, through 19, teaches that Jewish people are meant to remain Jewish after coming to trust in Messiah. It says, However that may be, let each of you lead the life that the Lord has assigned, to which God called you. This is my rule in all the congregations. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. At this time, the word circumcision did not simply refer to the single commandment, but rather it stood for a Jew's life being committed to Torah observance. We see this connotation stated explicitly in Acts 15.5, Acts 21.21, and Galatians 5.3. So here, Paul is essentially saying, if you are Jewish, remain Jewish and committed to a life of Torah. So this makes it quite clear that the Jewish spouse and the Jewish children are meant to continue living as Jews. The Messianic Synagogue is a great solution for when both spouses are followers of Jesus, and could even be if only one spouse is a follower of Jesus. So, if this describes your situation, joining the Messianic Synagogue is the clear solution, and I think it would actually require an exceptional situation to be called away from the Messianic Synagogue. The second indication is if you are born into it. If you are the child of Messianic Gentiles, then you are called to join them in their place of worship and religious lifestyle because they are leading you and directing your home. Of course, just like anyone else, the time will come for you to make your own decisions about where to worship and how to live, but until that time comes, unity in the household is most important. And while we are on this point about unity in the family, if you are a mother or a father and you are the only one who thinks that you are called to join a Messianic synagogue as a non-Jew, 
and your spouse or children are resistant to it, then I strongly recommend considering their resistance as an indication that you are not being led to join, or at least not yet. I have heard stories of non-Jews joining Messianic synagogues, and it creates a lot of tension and strife within their families, and a divided family is certainly not God's desire. Now moving on to more subjective indications. God might be leading you to the Messianic synagogue as a non-Jew if you have Ahavat Yisrael, feeling God's love for Israel in your own heart. About this, Messianic rabbi Russ Resnick says, I propose that Ahavat Yisrael, love for Israel, provides the best model for full Gentile participation in Messianic Judaism. Ahavat Yisrael speaks not only of God's love for Israel, but also of our love for Israel, for the living Jewish people around us. Believers from among the Gentiles may share in this aspect of Ahavat Yisrael as well, and this share is the key to fruitful Gentile participation in Messianic Judaism. Ahavat Yisrael, more than any other model, describes the calling of Gentiles within Messianic Judaism. Messianic Rabbi Rich Nickel distinguishes Gentiles who have Ahavat Yisrael from those who have an abstract positive emotion directed generally toward Israel and the Jewish people. He says they have a high regard for the Jewish people, not as an idealized mass of eschatological mini Abrahams and Sarahs, but as the real people they know from real history, work, and the JCC. So if you are considering joining a Messianic synagogue and the driving force behind that is a deep love for Israel, which you have gained from your own experience with Jewish people, then perhaps you are in fact being led to do so. I think this is supplemented if you also feel a strong desire to teach Christians and other non-Jews about God's love for Israel and the Jewish people and are willing to take a stand against anti-Semitism of all sorts, especially any coming from churches. I think this is one of the missions of Messianic Gentiles, to share with other non-Jews God's heart for Israel and the Jewish people, both those who trust in Messiah and those who do not yet. Another important thing to consider when it comes to whether God is leading you to Messianic Judaism is to consider that perhaps you are being led to Messianic Judaism only for a temporary time. This paradigm was brought to my attention in a wonderful article written by a Gentile follower of Jesus, Joseph Colbertson. In this article, he likens his time in the Messianic community to a Nazarite vow, a temporary season of heightened commitment and renewal before returning to the church refreshed. He writes, Many other Gentile believers have been called to be a part of the Messianic Jewish movement long term or even permanently. This is particularly the case for those who have married Messianic Jews and made a commitment to raise their children as Jews. The Messianic movement has done a wonderful job of welcoming these individuals and incorporating them into the community. Others, like myself, may have been called to be a part of the movement for a season. I find the Nazarite vow to be a helpful analogy for this experience. For me, it was a choice to follow these standards for a season. When I rested from my work on the Sabbath, ate matzah during Passover, or pitched a tent during Sukkot, I did it out of a love and devotion for the God of Israel. I thought this was an incredibly thoughtful and helpful way of thinking about his time in our community, and he was able to bring back his appreciation of Israel and the Jewish people to the church and work toward building bridges between the communities and help improve the church's understanding of God's continued commitment to Israel. So, all of this to say, if you are considering becoming a Messianic Gentile and you don't have one of those practical, objective indications, then it is ultimately a decision between you and the Lord to determine whether you are being led by the Spirit to join the Messianic Jewish community. It's not always easy to determine whether you are properly interpreting God's leading. I think you can increase your confidence that you are properly hearing from the Lord if you correctly understand what a Messianic Gentile is, what a Messianic Gentile is not, and how Messianic Judaism views itself and the church, and ultimately if your values align with what a Messianic Gentile is, well, then that can help give you confidence. And so I hope I was able to provide some clarity on those things today. When it comes to suggesting guidelines such as I've done here, Rabbi Rich Nickel makes a crucial comment. He says, The rules don't cover every situation. Sometimes the only reason for justifying a particular Gentile's participation among us is simple love flowing from our mandate to love people who may not get it. 
concerning the specifics of Messianic Jewish theology or practice. These souls should be welcome to sojourn among us for no other reason than the fact that they may have attended for a long time or because the community senses a goodness and holiness which ennobles the community or simply because they have nowhere else to go. At the end of the day, we Messianic Jews are meant to demonstrate the love of Messiah and welcome all who thirst for him. While a part of that love is to clearly define who we are and what we are about in order to be clear in what potential members are signing themselves and their families up for, we have to rely on the love of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit and how to handle these situations case by case. We must empower non-Jews considering joining with the best understanding and perspective available for them to decide especially those who have already worshipped and served side by side with us, but perhaps have been led astray by Hebrew Roots teachings online. And so, there you have it. Now you understand a little bit more about a valuable set of members in the Messianic Jewish community, the Messianic Gentiles. If you've learned something new or gained new perspective or disagree with something I said, let me know in the comments and please subscribe to the YouTube channel and the podcast. We appreciate you joining us. See you next time.